Hi guys and welcome back to HTP Storytime and tonight we're going to be completing our reading of the Damon Runyon classic Butch Minds the Baby and the last time we left our heroes they were on their way to the scene of the crime or future crime the crime is yet to be committed so uh, let's jump right into it Butch has John Ignatius Jr. rolled up in a blanket and John is still pounding his ear, meaning to sleep. Butch has a satchel of tools and what looks to me like a big flat book. And just before we leave the house, Butch hands me a package and tells me to be very careful with it. Butch has a satchel of tools and what looks to me like a big flat book. And just before we leave the house, Butch hands me a package and tells me to be very careful with it. He gives little Isidore a smaller package, which Isidore shoves into his pistol pocket. And when Isidore sits down in the taxi, something goes wah-wah, like a sheep. I don't know what sheep goes wah-wah, but anyway. And Big Butch becomes very indignant, because it seems Isidore is sitting on John Ignatius Jr.'s doll, which says mama when you squeeze it. There we go. It seems Big Butch figures that John Ignatius Jr. may wish something to play with in case he wakes up. And it is a good thing for little Isidore that the mama doll is not squashed, so it cannot say mama anymore. Or the chances are little Isidore will get a good bust in this newt. We let the taxi cab go a block away from the spot we are headed for in West 18th Street, between 7th and 8th Avenues, and walk the rest of the way two by two. I walk with Big Butch, carrying my package, and Butch is lugging the baby and his satchel and the flat thing that looks like a book. It is so quiet down in West 18th Street at such an hour that you can hear yourself think, and in fact I hear myself thinking very plain that I am a big sap to be on a job like this, especially with a baby, but I keep going just the same, which shows you what a very big sap I am indeed. There are very few people in West 18th Street when we get there, and one of them is a fat guy who is leaning against the building, almost in the center of the block, and who takes a walk for himself as soon as he sees us. It seems that this fat guy is the watchman at the coal company's office and is also a personal friend of Harry the Horse, which is why he takes the walk when he sees us coming. Nice. It's agreed before we leave Big Butcher's house that Harry the Horse and Spanish John are to stay outside the place as lookouts while Big Butch is inside opening the safe. And that little Isidore is to go with Butch. Nothing whatever is said by anybody about where I am to be at any time. And I can see that no matter where I am, I will still be an outsider. But as Butch gives me the package to carry, I figure he wishes me to remain with him. Sure. It is no bother at all getting into the office of the coal company, which is on the ground floor, because it seems the watchman leaves the front door open, this watchman being a most obliging guy indeed. In fact, he is so obliging that by and by he comes back and lets Harry the horse and Spanish John tie him up good and tight and stick a handkerchief in his mouth and chuck him in an area way next to the office, so nobody will think he has anything to do with opening the safe in case anybody comes around asking. The office looks out on the street and the safe that Harry the Horse and Little Isidore and Spanish John wish Big Butch to open is standing up against the rear wall of the office facing the street windows. There is... <laughs> there is one little... <clears throat> There is one little electric light burning very dim over the safe so that when anybody walks past the place outside, such as watchmen, they can look in through the window and see the safe at all times. I can see Big Butch grin when he sees it, so I figure this safe is not much of a safe, just as Harry the Horse claims. Well, as soon as Big Butch and the baby and little Isidore and me get into the office, Big Butch steps over to the safe and unfolds what I think is the big flat book. And what is it but a sort of screen painted on one side to look exactly like the front of a safe? Big Butch stands the screen up on the floor in front of the real safe, leaving plenty of space in between. The idea being that the screen will keep anyone passing in the street outside from seeing Butch while he's opening the safe. Because when a man is opening a safe, he needs all the privacy he can get. Big Butch lays John Ignatius Jr. down on the floor 
on the blanket behind the phony's safe front and takes his tools out of the satchel and starts to work opening the safe. While little Isidor and me get back in a corner where it is dark because there is not room for all of us back of the screen. However, we can see what Big Butch is doing. And I must say, while I never before see a professional safe opener at work and never wish to see another, this Butch handles himself like a real artist. He starts drilling into the safe around the combination lock, working very fast and very quiet, when all of a sudden, what happens but John Ignatius Jr. sits up on the blanket and lets out a squall. Naturally, this is most disquieting to me, and personally, I'm in favor of beaning John Ignatius Jr. with something to make him keep still, because I'm nervous enough as it is. But the squalling does not seem to bother Big Butch. He lays down his tools and picks up John Ignatius Jr. and starts whispering, There, 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 my idiot limbs. Dada is here. Well, this sounds very nonsensical to me in such a situation, and it makes no impression whatever on John Ignatius Jr. He keeps on squalling, and I judge he is squalling pretty loud because I see Harry the Horse and Spanish John both walk past the window and look in very anxious. Big Butch jiggles John Ignatius Jr. up and down and keeps whispering baby talk to him, which sounds very undignified coming from a high-class safe opener. And finally, Butch whispers to me to hand him the package I am carrying. He opens the package and what is in it but a baby's nursing bottle full of milk. Moreover, there is a little tin stew pan and Butch hands the pan to me and whispers to me to find a water tap somewhere in the joint and fill the pan with water. So I go stumbling around in the dark in a room behind the office and bark my shins several times before I find a tap and fill the pan. I take it back to Big Butch and he squats there with a the baby on one arm and gets a tin of what is called canned heat out of the package and lights this canned heat with his cigar lighter and starts heating the pan of water with a nursing bottle in it. Big Butch keeps sticking his finger in the pan while it is heating and by and by he puts the rubber nipple of the nursing bottle in his mouth and takes a pull at it to see if the milk is warm. Apparently the milk is okay as Big Butch hands the bottle to John Ignatius Jr. who grabs hold of it with, who grabs hold of it with both hands and starts sucking on the business end. Oh, easy now. Naturally he has to stop squalling and Bitch Butch Naturally, he has to stop squalling, and Big Butch goes to work on the safe again, with John Ignatius Jr. sitting on the blanket, pulling on the bottle, and looking wiser than a tree full of owls. It seems the safe is either a tougher job than anybody figures, or Big Butch's tools are not so good, what with being old and rusty and used for building baby cribs, because he breaks a couple of drills and works himself into quite a sweat without getting anywhere. Butch afterward explains to me that he's one of the first guys in this country to open safes without explosives. But, he says, to do this work properly, you have to know the safes so as to drill to the tumblers of the lock just right. And it seems that this particular safe is a new type to him, even if it is old and he is out of practice. Well, in the meantime, John Ignatius Jr. finishes his bottle and starts mumbling again and Big Butch gives him a tool to play with. Finally, Butch needs this tool and tries to take it away from John, and the baby lets out such a squawk that Butch has to let him keep it until he can sneak it away from him, and this causes even more delay. Finally, Big Butch gives up trying to drill the safe open, and he whispers to us that he will have to put a little shot in it to loosen up the lock which is all right with us because we are getting tired of hanging around and listening to John Ignatius Jr.'s glug glug glugging. As far as I am personally concerned, I am wishing I am home in bed. While well, Butch starts pouring through his satchel looking for something and it seems that what he's looking for is a little bottle of some kind of explosive with which to shake the lock on the safe up some. And at first he cannot find this bottle, but finally he discovers that John Ignatius Jr. has it and he's gnawing at the cork and Butch has quite a battle making John Ignatius Jr. give it up. Anyway, he fixes the explosive in one of the holes, he drills and near the combination lock on the safe, and then he puts in a fuse, and just before he touches off the fuse, Butch 
picks up John Ignatius Jr. and hands him to little Isidore and tells us to go into the room behind the office. John Ignatius Jr. does not seem to care for little Isidore, and I do not blame him. He starts to squirm around quite some in Isidore's arms and lets out a squall, but all of a sudden he becomes very quiet indeed, and while not able to prove it, something tells me that little Isidore has his hand over John Ignatius Jr.'s mouth. Well, Big Butch joins us right away in the back room, and sound comes out of John Ignatius Jr. again, as Butch takes it from little Isidore. <laughs> And I'm thinking that it is a good thing for Isidore that the baby cannot tell Big Butch what Isidore does to him. I put in just a little bit of shot, Big Butch says, and it will not make any more noise than snapping your fingers. But a second later, there is a big boom from the office and the whole joint shakes. And John Ignatius Jr. laughs right out loud. The chances are he thinks it is the 4th of July. Well, I guess maybe I put in too big a charge, Big Butch says, and then he rushes into the office with little Isidore and me after him. And John Ignatius Jr. is still laughing very heartily for a small baby. The door of the safe is swinging loose and the whole joint looks somewhat wrecked, but Big Butch loses no time in getting his dukes into the safe and grabbing out two big bundles of cash money which he sticks inside his shirt. As we go into the street, Harry the Horse and Spanish John come running up much excited and Harry says to Big Butch like this, What are you trying to do, he says, wake up the whole town? Well, Butch says, I guess maybe the charge is too strong at that, but nobody seems to be coming so you and Spanish John walk over to 8th Avenue and the rest of us will walk to 7th and if you go along quiet, like people minding their own business, it will be alright. But I judge little Isidore is tired of John Ignatius Jr.'s company by this time because, he says, he will go with Harry the Horse and Spanish John and this leaves Big Butch and John Ignatius Jr. and me to go the other way. So we start moving and all of a sudden two cops come tearing around the corner towards which Harry and Isidore and Spanish John are going. The chances are the cops hear the earthquake Big Butch lets off and are coming to investigate. But the chances are too that if Harry the horse and the other two keep on walking along very quietly like Butch tells them to, the coppers will pass them up entirely, because it is not likely that coppers will figure anybody to be opening safes with explosives in this neighborhood. But the minute Harry the horse sees the coppers, he loses his nut and he outs of the old equalizer and starts blasting. And what does Spanish John do but get his out too and open up? The next thing anybody knows, the two coppers are coming down on the ground with slugs in them, but other coppers are coming from every which direction, blowing whistles and doing a little blasting themselves, and there is plenty of excitement, especially when the coppers who are not chasing the Harry the Horse and little Isidore and Spanish John start poking around the neighborhood and find Harry's pal, the watchman, all tied up nice and tight where Harry leaves him, and the watchman explains that some scoundrels blow open the safe he is watching. All this time, Big Butch and me are walking in the other direction towards 7th Avenue, and Big Butch has John Ignatius in his arms, and John Ignatius is now squalling very loud indeed. The chances are he's still thinking of the big woom back there, which tickles him so, and is wishing to hear some more wooms. Anyway, he's beating his own best record for squalling as we go walking along. Butch says to me like this, I dare not run, he says because if any coppers see me running, they will start popping at me and maybe hit John Ignatius Jr. And besides, running will joggle all the milk up in him and make him sick. My old lady always warns me never to joggle John Ignatius Jr. when he is full of milk. Well, Butch, I say, <laughs> there is no milk in me and I do not care if I'm joggled up. So if you do not mind, I will start doing a piece of running at the next corner. But just then, around the corner of 7th Avenue, towards which we are headed, comes two or three coppers with a big fat sergeant with them, and one of the coppers, who is half out of breath, as if he has been doing plenty of sprinting, is explaining to the sergeant that somebody blows up a safe down the street and shoots a couple of coppers in the getaway. And there is Big Butch with John Ignatius Jr. in his arms and 20 G's in his shirt front and a tough record behind him walking right up to them. 
I'm feeling very sorry indeed for Big Butch and very sorry for myself too. And I'm saying to myself that if I get out of this, I will never associate with anyone but ministers of the gospel as long as I live. I can remember thinking that I'm getting a better break than Butch at that because I will not have to go to Sing Sing for the rest of my life like him. And I also remember Ron, and I also remember wondering what they will give John Ignatius Jr. who is still tearing off these schools with Big Butch saying, there, there, daddy's eating wooglyums. When I hear one of the coppers say to the fat sergeant, we better nail these guys, they may be in on this. Well, I can see it is goodbye to Butch and John Ignatius Jr. and me as the fat sergeant steps up to Big Butch. But instead of putting the arm on Butch, the fat sergeant only points at John Ignatius Jr. and asks very sympathetic, Teeth? No, Big Butch says, not teeth, colic. I just get the doctor here out of bed to do something for him and we are going to a drugstore to get some medicine. Well, naturally, I'm very much surprised at this statement, because of course I am not a doctor. And if John Ignatius Jr. has colic, it serves him right, but I'm only hoping they do not ask for my degree, when the fat sergeant says, Ah, oh, too bad. I know what it is. I got three of them at home, but, he says, it acts more like it is teeth than colic. Then as Big Butch and John Ignatius Jr. and me go on about our business and hear the fat sergeant say to the copper, very sarcastic, yeah, of course he's out of blowing safes with a baby in his arms. You'll make a great detective, you will. I do not see Big Butch for several days after I learn that Harry the Horse and Little Isidore and Spanish John get back to Br Brooklyn all right, except they are a little nicked up here and there from, <laughs> from the slugs the coppers toss at them. While the coppers they clip are not damaged so much. The chances are I will not see Big Butch for several years if it is left to me. But he comes looking for me one night and he seems to be all pleasured up about something. Say, Big Butch says to me, you know I never give a copper credit for knowing any too much about anything. But I wish to say that this fat sergeant we run into the other night is very very smart indeed. He's right about it being teeth that is ailing John Ignatius Jr. for what happens yesterday but John cuts in his first tooth.